Hey, sister. Hey, sister. Join me, Courtney Lewis. And me, Carly Ferguson. In our conversational podcast about everyday situations. You can count on us to tell it to you straight with our own sisterly spin. Consider this a phone call with your own Southern sisters as we discuss with you personal accountability, healthy relationships, managing responsibilities, and contributing to society. Each episode will consist of straight talk and a call to action. Your sisters are calling. Thanks for answering. Welcome to Hey Sister. This is episode 32, It Takes a Village. I think we're all familiar with that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Today, we're wrapping up our motherhood series with an episode devoted to being a supportive mother within your community. If you haven't listened to our other episodes this month, consider this your sisterly nudge to go check them out. We've had some incredible guests as always. As a quick recap, Carly and I talked about the beauty of childbirth as we swapped birth stories in episode 28. Steve Sunday, an expert in the adoption arena, joined us for episode 29 to discuss the option of adoption and the selfless love of a birth mother. In episode 30, we were joined by Rachel Homolak, the founder of the wildly popular Bluey Memes Facebook group, for an episode about laughing through the chaos of motherhood. And last week, we were all inspired by Tyla Beers, also known as Cake and Tyla, in episode 31 about pursuing personal passions as a mom. Each of those episodes will be linked in the show notes, along with the description of this episode and today's call to action. And we always include a minute marker timeline in case you want to take a peek at what's ahead or return to a certain point. We also include links to any articles or websites we might refer to and our guest host social media info. Speaking of guest hosts, as teenagers, Courtney and I had the pleasure of seeing an exuberant, kind young mom on Sundays. To be honest, as a teen, I didn't know how many kids she had or an estimate of how old she was, but she had a certain Bethan say quoi. <laughs> I do remember noticing that she had fun friends and her husband seemed like her best friend. She was musically talented, was fashionable, and dressed modestly, and she was happy with a beautiful smile. Bethann Sands inspired both of us in our younger years, but thanks to Facebook, we have continued to see her fun loving and kind face in our news feeds. Now, as moms ourselves, we have had an added level of appreciation for these qualities and a lot more curiosity into how she keeps them than we had as teenagers. Beth Ann and her husband, Matt, have teenagers now, so I'm excited to hopefully get the cheat codes for that level up. With that, Beth Ann, welcome to Hey Sister. Hey, what is up? I'm so happy to be here. Yay! <laughs> and it's a little bit scary to know that you guys were watching me when I didn't even have teenagers. Well, I'm pretty sure our mom like nudged us and was like, hey, look at her, because we didn't have you as a youth leader or anything like that. I think you were with the primary. Correct. Yep. I was the eternal like primary, which is all the little kids in our church mm-hmm. leader for forever. I never thought I would get to be around teenagers because sometimes when you are musical and you can play the piano, you kind of get stuck <laughs> in one certain place. So I thought that would be my life until it took a huge turn about six years ago. So we'll talk about that in a while. <laughs> Well, I'm so excited. And I think Carly's right. I do remember mom speaking of that sisterly nudge that I mentioned earlier. It was a maternal nudge where our mom was like elbowing us like, do you see this cutie walking in? And I remember all three of the girls in our family looked over and were like, ooh, shiny. (laughs) (laughs) She seems fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, the best like full circle story about this whole thing is that raising young kids in that same church congregation, Matt Sands and I would always look at the families with older kids and try to figure out how they're doing it for keeping their kids so close. And I honestly, no exaggeration, walked up to Nancy Shane at a church activity and said, tell me how you do it. What's one thing that we can do to make sure that our kids are going to end up like your kids? And she said, I just spend time with them. And we talk about that all the time about how Nancy Shane gave us our best parenting advice. And I fall short of that a whole lot of the time, but it honestly helped me know how to parent now. So it's like the best full circle moment. Oh, that's so sweet. Circle well, that- of motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> and it moves us all. Oh, yes. <laughs> we have a little gospel moment too here. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your family and your experiences teaching and being involved with youth? Absolutely. Matt Sands and I celebrate our 20 year wedding anniversary this year. We have kind of a unique start where we met on a Monday, got engaged 
that Saturday, six days later, and then got married seven weeks later. What? And 20 years later, here we are with our beautiful children. So we started our family right away, thankfully with Aiden. And then we actually have been blessed enough to be pregnant eight times, but we have four living children. Thanks to modern medicine, we figured out how to keep our babies here. And then I had an incredible childhood. I'm the youngest of seven, but all of my siblings are much older than me. There's a 25 year age gap between me and my siblings. So I got a lot of one-on-one attention from my mom and dad because I was like the bonus baby. They're both very musical and they put all of their musicality into me. And I was the golden child who actually listened to my parents. (laughs) So I stuck with piano lessons. I've been playing since I was three. And I started into choir when I was in high school. And then that's where I knew I just wanted to be a music teacher. I started teaching piano lessons after everybody I knew continued to ask me when I was like in my 20s. I started to teach about 17 years ago out here in Texas. All of my people that I started teaching are now graduating college, which is amazing. So I started teaching out here with piano and loved it. And then One thing that you'll learn about me is if somebody just says, have you thought about doing this or you should do this? The narcissistic part of my brain's like, why don't I do that? Yes, I'll try to do that. So somebody said, have you ever thought of doing a show choir? Well, why don't I do a show choir? So I started a show choir 12 years ago. Just absolutely love doing that, doing like pop songs, Broadway songs. And I did all of that while I was doing the primary calling with the younger children in our church congregation for a really long time. So I tend to have a hard time balancing things, right? So I would have a hard time saying no to new piano students. I got really overextended with teaching a lot of piano students, taking on a lot of show choir students, and trying to do my calling and raising the kids and Matt Sands's job out here was really busy. So one day while teaching piano, I just got this very distinct feeling of it's time to slow down. And it was the craziest feeling. And usually I would a hundred percent would shut down those feelings and keep going (laughs) because I don't pay attention to it, but it was a very important moment for me. So I stepped back from teaching piano lessons, which broke my heart because I miss all those families. And I just continued on to do show choir. Well, then that was right at the time that Aiden, my oldest, was going into middle school, high school. And it really gave me time to Nancy Shane it and really be around for him and be around for like the little kids in the moments where I didn't think that he needed me. So I continued to do show choir until I, for some reason, got switched from (laughs) primary to the young women in our church congregations, but I'd never served with the teenagers. And they didn't call me to our single church congregation. They called me to what we call the stake, but it's the regional. So I all of a sudden got put into this whole world. I had no idea what to do. And they just, here, why don't you do a hoedown? Why don't I do a hoedown? So I like (laughs) had to teach myself how to do a hoedown. And then they said, we have this mixer and these speakers. Why don't you DJ the steak dance? okay, why don't I? And 100% sat down and taught myself how to DJ within two weeks. And that turned my world around. So fast forward to now, I am a DJ on the weekends for our church congregation, for community things, for a lot of school events, for weddings. And then I get to be a substitute teacher in my kids' schools. And I just received a call to be a seminary teacher, which I'll refer to a lot, I think, today. And that is our early morning Bible study or like scripture study for the high school students in our community. And I now have an 18-year-old. So Aiden graduates this week. So if I get teary, it's going to be fine. You guys just support me through the tears. He's going to University of Oregon this fall to do athletic training, which will be amazing. Beckett is 14. He's going to be a high school freshman, and he is my music theater geek. So he's going to New York for a huge workshop this summer, and you can see him in all the community theater around here. Everly is going to be a seventh grader and is 13 and just like the light of our lives because she's the only girl and our favorite daughter. And then (laughs) Ashton is going to be in fifth grade, and he is a future baseball legend. Just ask him. That's how he introduces himself. I love hearing about your family. I get to watch some of this online, but to hear you explain it just makes me feel even more bonded to you. I love hearing about your kids and about your involvement. I did not realize the DJing started as a church gig. 
It absolutely did. Again, I need to have a part of my brain that says, maybe you can't do that, but I just don't. So I learned on the church's system. We had an amazing system, by the way, that most DJs dream about. That's unusual, I'd say. <laughs> Correct. It, we're very spoiled up here. So I just learned off of that and then found what I was good at. I mean, I had a lot of failures. I've been booed quite a few times no. at a steak dance or a community oh. dance. Oh, it has happened. But then it's like a super funny story I get to share and I learn from it. But, oh yeah, I started it at church and then it just went on. And the best part is I on purpose don't advertise because again, I don't balance well and I cannot be gone that much from my family. And unfortunately, a DJ's job does not happen between the hours of 8 and 5 p.m. ever. (laughs) They're always like late night and on the weekend. So it has just blown up. It's kind of fun though. Well, that's totally inspiring for us. I feel like the opportunities find us for things where you're asked to do something and you feel like, sure, I can do that. You know, I've never done that before, but now's the time, I guess, to take that on. My husband jokes with me because we'll be someplace or driving down the road and I see a sign, a help wanted sign or like now hiring. And for some reason, part of me is like, they need help. Maybe I could become a Burger King manager. I don't know, but like, is that what I need to do? So it's funny to hear that and just be like, those things come at us and you can take them in stride. We're moving. And (laughs) it's right. We always are finding our purpose. (laughs) Yeah. Then it comes to find us too. (laughs) Carly, you are not the burger queen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That that's one that I, uh, I mentally turned down sooner, but like, shut her down. (laughs) But I think that was the moment that I realized, I think I might have a problem. (laughs) So we believe the family is the fundamental unit of society, but we know the old adage, it takes a village to raise a child is a hundred percent true. Could you talk a little bit about your approach to being part of the village for other children? Yeah, absolutely. So on top of everything else, I started in PTA probably five or six years ago, again, because someone walked up to me and said, why don't you be the PTA president? Why don't I? So that started my involvement with the children of our community. And even outside of just one certain religion, one certain church congregation, it started for the children of our community. And the thing that I have found as I sit back and realize, why do I do these things intentionally? Because sometimes I'm going through the day to day. I'm just trying to survive. I just try to like calm the chaos. But then one thing that I realized is I really try for the youth in our community to come to where they are. If I have my students in seminary and I am wanting to really help mentor them and not just be their teacher or not just be a leader, but really get into their lives, I go to them. I'm very spoiled that I get to be in the halls of the high school to where I get to see them in their natural environment there. And then I go to their sporting events. I go to the choir concerts. I try to go on their social media a whole lot and be their hype girl there. Or sometimes I'll take screenshots and then share it with the rest of our class. And I try to help the rest of the class be the mentors for each other as well. When I asked Aiden about what is it that you see that I do that I can share with this podcast. And it was a really big compliment from an 18 year old that has watched me fail for the majority of his 18 years that he said, the best part is that you're very casual with the youth that come into your classrooms that go into the church as you're in the room with them they feel better because they know that you belong with them and that you're not going to put them on the spot for things or your casualness just helps them to let their guard down a little Mm -hmm. bit, which I thought was a huge compliment because sometimes I don't see that from the outside. I just see as they come in, I'm trying to like smile and help them feel like they have a place where I am. Because oftentimes, even if you see somebody who thinks that they know that that's their seat, that they know that this is their classroom, they feel very alone and you wouldn't even guess it. Yeah. I think that is really awesome that you extend yourself as the friend first, putting yourself towards them. I feel like in the times that I've been with teenagers, even now, there's this part of me that remembers back to that time and 
feels like, oh, it's not cool to go up to them. I don't want to like scare them <laughs> or come on too strong scare them. and come up and say, <laughs> hey, how's it going? And they look at me like, oh, you're not cool. I can't talk to you. But remembering that they need that confidence boost. And man, it'd be nice to think of an older person who is more consistent in their emotions and their support for you to give that to you because sometimes it feels really up and down, right? Like it's a lot of drama in high school. It's always changing who is friends, who is not. And to feel like there's this person who comes up and just freely gives happiness and friendship like you do, I'm sure that does really give them that confidence boost they need in those hard times. I hope so, but you're exactly right. And it goes even beyond the drama. You walk these high school halls, the middle school halls, and the wars that these guys are fighting within themselves, not against each other, but against the world, we have zero idea. Even from three years ago, people that were teenagers just in the last few years, it is a whole new ball game that they have going on here. And it's just the fact that you said, if an adult will show up for them, that's massive. That's all they need. I'm sure you guys have seen the videos of a kindergartner at a concert that is like looking for their mom and you see their face and how their face changes the minute that they see their mom. I think sometimes we forget that as teenagers because sometimes we don't get a lot back. Sometimes their facial expressions or their reactions don't give us that. But now that I'm kind of on the other side, I have the one teenager who's now just going to leave my house. It has been eye-opening to see that those reactions are in them, and I've had to learn to not take it personal and to just keep doing what I'm doing. Mother's Day last year was a big turning point for me because I loved substituting, I loved doing the PTA stuff, but sometimes having teenagers is absolutely hard because you just feel like no matter what I do, you're fighting me or you're not thrilled about what I'm doing for you. And Aiden gave a Mother's Day talk, and in it he said, I asked my friends about having my mom as a teacher, and they said that when they leave your classroom, their day goes much better after they've been in your classroom. And I just thought, that's it. It it was just that one little nugget that I would have never known because you don't get that back from them. I'll have 32 kids walk into the class. Hey, guys, I'm so happy you're here. Here's what we're doing today. Let me know if you need my help. And then they leave. Bye, guys. Have the best Monday. Like one kid will say goodbye back. You don't get anything back usually from the youth. But I found that the more consistent I was, or even if I'm like, love you, what other teachers say love you at the high school? Just giving those extra little tidbits and treating them casual as if I would my own kid or my friend the more that they just felt comfortable and they could be themselves. And I slowly started to get love yous back. I have teenagers that will run through the hall and come and tackle me in a hug. And it just is so rewarding because I just kept showing up. Okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. And just that bubbly personality that felt like I was getting nothing back for like a year. And it finally started to reward me somehow. I really appreciate that you're willing to be bubbly and put yourself out there and probably feeling rejected at the beginning. Like you're saying it took a year. Correct. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot of time to feel like nobody's reciprocating and to feel like you're acting a fool just to keep being there and being consistent for them. I was talking to my husband the other day about you coming on this podcast and I was explaining to him that what it was that you did within the church congregation, being a seminary teacher. And he said, you know, Courtney, One of my regrets in life was how my class treated our seminary teacher when I was a sophomore in high school. He said, our seminary teacher was a young female. First year out of college, she was prepared to be a seminary teacher. She was ready to do it. She shows up to the class and is teaching. And my husband said that every day, or at least once a week, she would break down crying during the class. And she would tell the class, I don't know what's going wrong. I'm praying for you every day. And he said that there were some seniors in the class that made it their goal to misbehave. And he was like, I was a sophomore. I couldn't really change anything, but it became the joke that she would show up every day and just be like, I don't know why you're not listening to me. Please listen to me. And just as far as I can tell, I know it breaks my heart because he at 35 years old, happy birthday, honey, by the way. (laughs) he's like, I feel guilt that this teacher quit because we were such a rowdy and bad class. 
And I don't want to critique this woman. I've never met her, but I can admire you, Beth Ann, for putting yourself out there every day, day after day. And this teacher ended up quitting a few weeks in because she just couldn't yeah. keep up with that class. And I don't know how much she was putting herself out there, being willing to act bubbly and really feel vulnerable, but props to you for making it work and for fighting through whatever that first year looked like, whether it was some good days or mostly bad days, I don't know, but I'm glad that you fought through. Cause even just like the other day, when you posted a picture of some gold sequence romper that your kids gave you, is that true? I love that. Oh my gosh, you guys, <laughs> that is the craziest story. I mean, it's heartbreaking what happened with that seminary teacher, because for those who don't know, it's a volunteer position. You're not paid and you spend four hours a week teaching this class, not to mention your prep time. So it takes quite a bit of time, but and it's early in the morning and it is early. <laughs> Mine is only 7 a.m. So I have to always say that we're spoiled. We don't have to do the 5 30 a.m. that the other class does, but it is only 7 a.m. But I do have to give the shout out to my seminary 7 a.m. class because I will fight anybody. They are literally the greatest youth in this area, in the state of Texas, I will go on and on <laughs> because these youth not only showed up, but their attendance was like 90 to 95%, which is a little bit unheard of with seminaries wow. sometimes. And to go back to your husband's seminary teacher, yeah, there were days that were really hard really hard. And it's me. I know these kids. I've been their DJ for a lot of things. I have no shame or dignity sometimes. So I will <laughs> show up crazy. Humor is going to be the way humor and joy is the way that you're going to get through to the teenagers, even if they don't give you a lot back. So my greatest seminary class in the world, they are the loves of my life. They know that. And they're all my favorite student. Ask each of them. They know that. I'm sure they're not the loves of your life compared to Matt Sands, which I love that you say his first and last name. Yeah. You know how many Matts there are, Courtney? There are lots of Matts. If I just say Matt, people get very confused. <laughs> it is always Matt Sands, like Sands on the beach, always. Yeah. But we're so close as this class. I, of course, let them know, okay, I'm going on this podcast. What do you want the world to know that you wish that leaders knew about teenagers? And one of them was, please don't take things personal because we aren't meaning things in a mean way. We've had a rough day. Sometimes we're burnout. If we don't respond in class like you want it, please don't take it personal. And even for me, that I've been with them dozens of hours this year, that was shocking to me because these students, sometimes I'd be like, did I say something? That was it. I offended them. They're never coming back. They were so sad in class today. I don't know what I did, but I needed to just realize there's something else going on. And I think the more you teach, the more you realize that. So I'm hoping as I get more years under my belt doing this, then I'll start to really see that like something else is going on. So how can I help you? How can I reach out to you? The quieter kids in class, hey, as you're walking, I'm just going to walk beside you. Anybody want to ride to the high school? And just those minutes in the car really have gotten me closer with a lot of students. It is really hard. And there are days that these students will just make you feel like you're on top of the world when they buy you a sequined romper for your birthday <laughs> that is like the best thing of your life. Or there are days when you're like, did I get anything through to them? And I know that phones and teenagers are probably the biggest fight, the biggest cliche. And something that we tried this year in seminary, which really worked is I taught them that we are going to learn through your phones. Because there are all the studies that our teenagers are so attached to their phones that their anxiety goes through the roof if their phone is set aside. If you have it in a phone pocket on the wall, that works for a lot of classrooms, but your kids are not relaxed enough to learn. And I depend on a lot of emotional, spiritual feelings while I'm teaching. So we have really worked through the phone where I'm giving them a lot of tools and tactics and ways for them to learn through their phones because you're always going to have this. So how can I get you to learn that like Clash of Clans can wait for just a minute while you learn about this? We've even done, okay, I want you guys to text somebody this, put your phones down. The first person to get a notification and response gets this. So that goes back to the original thing is I've tried to come to them to where they are, just like the greatest teachers that you can think of have done. 
they come to where we are. They come meet us where we are and we feel bonded with them. We feel like they care. So when it comes to the phones, if I feel like they're not responding, I try to come to where they are. I've stopped the class before and we just sit and talk about an issue that has come up. I start a lot of classes with just sitting there and I say, okay, what have you guys heard at the school about our church? And I mean, it just starts opening up all kinds of mostly funny things. Oh, somebody said this. Can you believe this? Or, okay, what have you guys heard about this certain thing that happened on the news? Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. And then it opens up the conversation, but then we get to talk about what we believe about it. And it has really given them a really safe place when real things come up or they're needing to learn something real. We've already talked about this. We've already said weird or hard things or controversial things in this room. I can say this. And it's met with a lot of grace from the other students. And hopefully they feel that for me. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure they do feel that from you. I would be really curious to hear though, Beth Ann, how do you juggle being a mom and an influence to your own kids that are similar ages to all these kids that you have in your class? How does that balance look? Not well, (laughs) (laughs) not well. So I try a lot, but the funny stories are I have some talents, but cooking is not one of them. I just don't cook. That's fine. There's no excuse. There's no justification. I just don't cook. So I made the seminary class lamb. That's correct. I made them lamb. I cut it into little pieces. I brought it to the seminary class and we ate it. We did a whole lesson. So that night at dinner, we were talking about it. And my 14 year old said, you mean to tell me you made them lamb last night and I had ramen? I was like, (laughs) oh, fair. And then the next week I bought everybody socks to give out to the class. I did a really cute object lesson. And again, how was seminary today? Oh, we did this really cute sock thing and poem. And the 14 year old every time calls me, you mean to tell me you bought them socks. He takes off his shoe, holds his foot up and there's holes in his socks. He's like, and I have holes in my socks. So I've learned that I have to like help with the balance a lot. But what we've actually done with in our family and then with the seminary kids is that I have my 12-year-old daughter, who's in sixth grade, who's not of age to come to scripture study, started coming to seminary with me about three months ago and has not missed a day. She wakes herself up, she gets in the car, and she has come and started to insert herself into the class and has just been welcomed, and she's just one of them. We do a lot of things outside of the seminary classroom. We'll go do service projects. We've had field trips, and it's always the Sands family and the class. But when it comes to the community and really including them both, I will often introduce myself. Hi, I'm Mrs. Sands, or I'm Beckett's mom. Does everybody know Beckett? And that's how I'll just include everybody. And they'll often get a text like, oh, your mom was my sub. But the best part that I have done both is just by being part of the community and the PTA and being just an adult that is in their lives, a stable adult who knows their names, who will celebrate them and hype them up for even just the littlest thing. When my son became of dating age, he started to talk to this girl and then she said, wait, are you Mrs. Sand's son? And he goes, yeah. And she's like, let's go on a date. And that's been his (laughs) girlfriend for now a year and is the love of our lives. We love her so much. But I always tell him, I'm like, you're welcome for getting you this girl. (laughs) Their first date, they made me a birthday cake. It wasn't even my birthday, but they made me a birthday cake and brought it over. That is so cute. So I always tell people with the PTA, the benefits and perks are that you get to know your kids as friends, but then you help people get to know your kids in a whole different light. And they just know that they all know the Sands family, but Mm -hmm. also to the chagrin of if my son takes a turn a little too fast out of the high school, I get a text immediately, which has also happened. (laughs) Hey, just wanted to let you know, I saw Aiden. I'm like, oh, okay. Eyes and ears all over the place. That's great. I think earlier when you were talking about that casualness, meeting them where they're at, they're facing the world and we can let go of these expectations that they're going to reciprocate in the way that we want or we crave. Like they're not going to give us maybe the friendship that we want 
because they don't know our situation. At the time, I didn't know exactly how old you were. You know, you were a young mom, but I couldn't peg what age. And I think that is funny now because I had some girls talking to me and they're like, how old are you? You realize, oh, you don't know. And I, I guess that's just, I'm youthful in my appearance because I just am. Oh, <laughs> yes, you are. That is Please cut that out. <laughs> I didn't say it like that. It's like same. <laughs> no. <laughs> I always joke about that, especially because I don't wear makeup very much. But anywho, just saying that we have this expectation for them to reciprocate, to be grateful for what we do. And instead they are like, oh, you're extra, which might not even be a term that's current now. But at the time when I was serving with youth, that definitely was. And it was like oh, off-putting, like, no, I'm trying hard. And they're like, yeah, you're a try hard. I'm like, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is bad. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just love that meeting them where they're at, having your own reserve of confidence to help you to continue doing that without any expectation of reciprocation. Correct. Well, yeah. and the youth just value the authenticity, right? That's the real big buzzword is being authentic to your true self. And they can tell when you're being genuine and when you're not. And that's different for whoever you are. There are some youth that need a more quiet approach. And then there are some youth who need somebody to hype them up. And that's how they feel loved and appreciated. And these youth are just amazing. Literally, like the teenagers of our world are amazing. It just looks different than it did three years ago. And so it's our job to go and help them realize their awesomeness and to stay there at that level because mm-hmm. they can second guess themselves constantly and depression and anxiety is just rampant. And so how do we help teach them to navigate that? Because it's going to be there for forever. And we've talked about that a lot in our classes of how are we going to handle the stress and anxiety? Don't be afraid of it. Don't run away from it. But how are you going to handle it? Mm -hmm. And the more genuine that I found that I've been or I watch these other youth leaders, the more that these youth just respond to that. Teenagers will always respond if they know you're being genuine and if you have adults that talk down to them or immediately put them on high alert because they think these are bad kids, then they'll just shut down. And I've watched it. I've team taught in a class where they treat me one way and they treat the other teacher a completely different way because of the approach or how authentic you're being. Can they tell that you are enjoying being there or that you're on the defense because you're ready for them to do something bad? But then on the other hand, I've had two kids in a classroom that got up and started to get in each other's faces. And all I did is I just stood up and I go, oh my gosh, you guys wait. It's been my lifelong dream to break up a fight. Hold on. I'll be right there. And then they just started laughing and then sat down. Whatever your approach is, is going to be how they connect with you and reach back out to you. One of my students, Coda, came up to me at the end of a particularly like chaotic lesson. And I was saying something like, oh, tomorrow's lesson is going to be better, you guys. I could not pull it together. And she said, you know, your lessons are all over the place, but I'm always really engaged with them and I'm never engaged in other teachers' lessons. And I was like, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. (laughs) I am all over the place. I get it, but I guess you're never bored. They can really tell where your heart is, whether you're being extra or whether you come in quiet, but they can tell your admiration and respect for them. It goes a long way always. This is like so amazing. And I feel the response from your entire class, like if we could poll right. <laughs> like a group of teenagers to ask, I feel like that would be a great group because we can all feel a little intimidated sometimes. And it seems silly talking about it, but we were at a restaurant. It's Hat Creek. Shout out. Yeah. It's so good. And I'm like, good, a play place where my kids can play outside. So we were there. Kids are playing. And a young man came up to us to start talking and he was talking to us. Like he came to us and was just chatting. And I wish I had just had more to give or like what to say to him in response because he was just talking about sports. Obviously, I have no idea about sports or what's going on currently. That's one of those. If you haven't been watching things in the past year, then you are so behind. So I was talking to him briefly. And then we left and I thought, oh gosh, should I have done something more? So hearing from you about this, I think helps all of us when we're around, like, what should we be doing? Yeah. Just love them. Literally. That's it. 
and they'll always feel that. I work a lot with the high school counselor's office doing emergency care closet things for kids that are just needing a little extra love that day. And I remember asking him, if you could tell parents one thing as a piece of advice for all of these students that are coming in with panic attacks, for students that are just wanting to try to make it through the day. And he said, just listen to your teenagers. Take time to listen, which is going back to our Nancy Shane expert. If you take time to be around them, you'll take time to just listen to them. And we do that a lot in our family in the car. We try to just have no phone time in the car, which works 50% of the time. But the funniest conversations will happen, or there have been some real serious, poignant conversations that You just feel a little safer in the car if you're not looking at each other. We try for family dinners as much as we can, which was another suggestion from the counselor. Just as much as you can create normalcy, giving them a real easy place to listen and to be able to just talk. And you're going to get a lot of, I don't know, maybe. I had one win a couple months ago. I count them because they happen very infrequently. But I had one win with my kids. We got to go to the open house in Mesa where Matt Sands and I were married. So we drove out there and I was sitting at a lunch table and I was like, okay, everybody's phone's in the middle. And I was trying to think of unique ways because we get a lot of, how's your day? Good. What did you guys like about the temple? It was pretty. Just like little things. Mm -hmm. So I started to ask them. I said, Everly, can you name Aiden's favorite video game? And then the conversation went on, Beckett, do you know Ashton's favorite candy? And it became a game, but then it would be like, oh, Ashton, what is your favorite candy? And then they would start to get to know each other. And so that was one win that I thought, oh my gosh, I want to share that with the sisters of the podcast just to see if that could help somebody because it turned it into a game, but then it also turned it into we're really learning about just random things like Beckett, what's your all-time favorite movie? Ghostbusters. He's a big 80s buff. But it was like more pitting them against each other for some fun competition. And then it made them listen to each other. Like when else were they ever going to ask their brother how old they were when they first realized they liked to play baseball? Not really a question you ask them, but it was really fun for us. So I'm sure other people have thought of that and I'm really late to the game, but it really worked well for our table full of teenagers for a second. I feel like that just like light bulb moment for me hearing that, oh, you're modeling a good friend. You're showing them, hey, do you know this about them? Encouraging them to have that between themselves, but from the vantage point of the person who loves them and to inspire them to create that within themselves, I think is so great. I think we also need to take a moment to just recognize the fact that in that moment, you had a light bulb moment or some sort of heavenly inspiration to play that game. Because I love that you're sharing this idea because it is a great idea that you can take away from this podcast as something to try. But I think the overarching message there too is you might have an idea that comes to you in a fleeting moment to try something new that you've never done before. And then it ends up being a huge success. Not that they're huge successes, but I've got little kids. And I feel like those are the kind of things that happen to me regularly where I have like an idea to try some creative new way to package this idea to clean the game room and make it a fun game. And somebody told me the other day, they said, oh, my mantra is it doesn't have to be fun to be fun. (laughs) You know, you can make it fun. I feel like that's what parenting a little kid looks like. You're constantly trying to come up with creative ways to make this seem like a fun idea. So I love that you're coming up with ways for your teenagers to get them involved, to have conversations, because suddenly it's not about having fun and cleaning the game room. It's about conversing with other people. That's the challenge now. It's talking. Correct. And talking is not my kid's challenge right now. They're better test subjects, I feel like. We're just trying to experiment with these toddlers. For Mother's Day, Russia's teacher gave me a thing that said, I love my mom because she, you know, one of those. And the mom across the table, her son had said, because she prays with me, which was, I was like, oh, that's so sweet. And my son said, because she gives me candy in the car. <laughs> and I was like, that's not a regular thing. I don't even know. Okay, fine. They're like, They're just better test subjects because maybe they think about it in a deeper way, maybe just slightly, or maybe sometimes. But it might be more gratifying (laughs) to put in that effort and get better (laughs) payoffs. Listen, when I ask the class what you can tell the new seminary students about why seminary is awesome, 80% of the answers were the candy is great every time. So listen, (laughs) you are in good company and it doesn't end. They respond to candy. They feel love through the Skittles. Okay. They just do. And again, 
there's that win. But an, like another version of coming to them. So when you can't put their phone away, we started something in our family because it's getting real that Aiden will be leaving our home soon. So I've been trying to think of how can I really keep us all connected, but it's not forced. Like, why were you not on the Sunday phone call type thing? So there's a new app. I feel like I'm on the cutting edge. It's probably been around for forever and everybody's on it. But have you guys heard of the Be Real app? Nope. This is like a really easy kind of a social media app. So we each got on it in our family. And then at a certain time during the day, it sends you an alert and it says time to post your be real. And whatever you're doing right that minute, you have to take a picture and it takes a picture of what you're looking at and your face at the same time. And so sometimes it's like 2 p.m., 5 a.m. one time, which nobody got, <laughs> sometimes 9 p.m. But it is such an easy thing of, oh, that's funny. Aiden's getting his haircut right now. Oh, Everly's still in bed. It just is such an easy thing. You don't have to comment on it, but it keeps us all kind of connected. Matt Sands is at work still. Mom is watching a television show. It just was easy and it doesn't have to take a lot out of them or have them stretch too far. It's coming to their phones, which they're on as well. And it just has been like the easiest thing to keep us connected as like a family. So if you have teenagers that are about to go away or that are gone away and you're looking for that natural thing, it's really worked for our family. So it could work for other families. <laughs> I love it. But I'm wondering, do you have a call to action for our sisterhood besides this awesome Be Real app? What else do you have for us? <laughs> I do. My call to action, there's two. If you don't have a teenager in your house, go hype up a teenager. Just like Carly was saying, somebody walks up to you at Hack Creek, hype them up. Just like say hi to them. Cause I'm telling you, teenagers are really good about hyping up adults. Like they'll compliment you. They sometimes have no fear. It's us adults who kind of get stuck. So whether that be commenting on somebody's social media that you follow from your church congregation, your community, hype them up there, give them a compliment when you see them, make them feel seen. If you have teenagers and you don't regularly do like a family dinner, make a goal to just do one family dinner, make a goal to just be available to them. And the biggest call to action is just listen to your teenagers because there will be other people that will listen to them, but you want it to be you and you want it to be that safe space. And sometimes in a real world, if that can't be you, but there are trusted people in your community, in your church congregation, have them go be that safe person that they will be the listening ear for your teenager because there will be somebody out there and it 100% takes a village. So if it's not you, guess what? That's okay for that minute because it's not supposed to be just us all the time. The Sands kids can't learn everything they have to learn just from me. They need to be able to learn it from the other adults in their community and in their church congregation and in their family. And I hope that they do because there's so much more that they can become than that I can teach them. So go listen to a teenager and hype them up. We got some amazing teenagers out here. Love it. I love that call to action. I think uh, we can all benefit from hearing from this amazing group of youth that are around us. I know I have a niece and nephews around me now that I love getting to know while we are here in Waco. So I'm excited to hype them up and they're probably cringing already. <laughs> Even hype is an old word. But I know. I'm like, oh, I am a hype girl though. I say woohoo all the time. I know. I get away with it because I'm supposed to hype you up. I'm the DJ. So listen, it's still an old word, but we're carrying it on. Side yeah. part and all, we got this. Side part, skinny jeans. Yes. All the way. I know. Yes. I'm excited. They're wonderful and have so much to offer. So where can our sisters find you on social media so they can get to know you better? Well, they are more than welcome to come give me a follow on the TikTok. <laughs> There's nothing super inspirational happening there, but it's a whole lot of fun. So it's just at Beth Ann Sands on the TikTok. On Instagram, it's the same, but I do share a lot more of my seminary happenings when we're in class. And that's at Like Sands on the Beach, aka what I have to say every time I call the bank. It's Beth Ann Sands, Like Sands on the Beach. And I get it every time. <laughs> Beth Ann, it has seriously been such a pleasure to have you on today. And there is only one Beth Ann Sands. And we are glad that you joined our podcast. Remember this call to action this week, sisters. Go listen to a teenager and hype them up. We are saying it's an old term, this hype term, but just blow up the feed. 
do whatever you can to make a teenager feel better. And it'll make you feel better in the process too. Cause like Beth Ann said, they are awesome sources of confidence as well. Maybe they won't buy you a gold sequence romper, but they might tell you, thank you. They might not respond at all, but you can do it. We're the adults in this scenario, right? So remember that call to action. I just want to say I've had some awesome aha moments during this episode. And one thing I want to share is that idea that it takes a village. Something I've been thinking about is when I think back on my childhood, I can give the majority of the credit to who I am as a person, whether it's credit or discredit, I don't know, but credit would go to my parents. They definitely shaped a lot of who I am, but I'm forever grateful for other adults besides my parents who took an interest in my future. And so we're really grateful that you could be on here today to talk about this whole, it takes a village approach. Now, sisters, we do want to remind you that we're going to include links to the app, Be Real app that Beth Ann shared with us today. And we're also going to include the links to her TikTok account and her Instagram account as well. And we want you to come back and join us in June and July every week for our summer hot topic series, where Carly and I are going to be diving deeper into real life conversations we have as sisters. So this is going to be our summer hot topics and they will not be hot button issues necessarily, but they will be hot topics that come up again and again in our real phone calls. They'll be passion filled with a variety of stories, experiences, and sisterly advice and opinions about everyday experiences and pop culture culture trends. It'll be a lot of fun and we hope you join us. Beth Ann, thanks again for joining us today. And sisters, thanks as always for answering our call this week. We'll talk to y'all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So remember sisters, this awesome call to action this week, listen to a young person. What are they called? Say that. Don't say young person. (laughs) <laughs> to a young and <laughs> <laughs> listen to a whippersnapper. Courtney is a uh, what do they call a geriatric millennial? Poor Courtney. Wait, I can't all be youthful and so Stop. perfect. Okay. Beth Ann, who are these amazing kids you've been talking about this whole time? I am so glad you asked. We've got Ainsley and Alex and Bryn and Clara, Jack and Jackson, Jake and Justin, Keaton and Kira, Coda and Landon, Layla and Lexa, Liam and Lily, Masha and Marley. We got Ryland and Spencer and Taryn and Thad, Trent, Zaylin, Beckett, Gabby, Lily, Lily, Samia, Riley, and Gracie. Boom. Whoop, whoop. I was throwing in some woes. I heard the beatbox in the back. Way to go. I'm sure I forgot people. I pray that I didn't. They know I'll give them some candy if I forgot their name.